ہوں گے تو میں وہاں پر موجود ہوں سو خداون آج ہم یہاں پر تیرے نام اور تیرے عزت اور تیرے جلال کے لیے تیرے نام کو عزت اور جلال دینے کے لیے خدا ون جمع ہے سو خدا ون تو بردر سلامان کو اسی طرح اوینجل شاہین گل کو خدا ون تو اپنے خادم سٹیورڈ کو خدا ون اپنے ہینڈ میں کر سو خدا ون تیرے پاکرو کا شکر ادا کرتے ہیں مہربان خدا تیری پریزنس چاہتے ہیں ہالی اسپرٹ تھینک یو فار یور پریزنس تھینک یو تھینک یو ہالی اسپرٹ ہال لو یا پریس لاڈ سو خدا ون آج زوم میٹنگ کے شروع سے آخر تک خدا ون تو ہمارے ساتھ ہونا اور آج کا جو بھی ٹاپک ہے خدا ون بخش دینا کہ اس کے وسیلہ سے ہم برکت پا سکیں کیونکہ خدا ون تیرے کلام میں لکھا ہے کہ تم اپنے کلام پر تم اپنے مہربان خدا اسی طرح تم اپنے کلام پر توجہ دو تاکہ تم میں تم کو برکت ملتی رہے آئی خدا ون ہم تیرے کلام کو سننے کے لیے تیار ہیں ہم تیرے ہم تیرے کلام کو ایکسیپٹ کرنے کے لیے تیار ہیں اور خدا مند تو اسی طرح ہمیں زندگی میں اور زیادہ برکت دے بڑھا تاکہ ہم خدا مند اسی طرح تیرے نام کو عزت دلا دیتے ہیں سو خدا مند مہربان خدا پھر سے خدا ون میں تیرے خادم کو تیرے ممس کو خدا ون پاسٹر شیوٹ کو تیرے ہینڈ اوور کرتا ہوں شروع سے آخر تک تو بڑی مدد کرنا تھینک یو لارڈ جیس ان دا نیم آف جیس آمین Nice to see you back, Sajiban. Uh, we haven't seen you for a while. Nice to see you. Um, I was just thinking, you know, I know some of your testimonies and, you know, everyone that's here, God has done amazing things in, in our lives. And uh, it's just amazing the way God puts things together, isn't it? And, and what he does for us. So I just... Uh, want to encourage you uh, with the brothers and sisters that we have that come on. Um, everyone has a special testimony, the way the Lord has touched them in a special way. And uh, that's, that's the amazing thing when we can get together and we can share our time together and uh, just know um, that the Lord loves each one of us, no matter where we are, and that he has a plan and a purpose for each of us. So I'm just going to jump into our study here. If you weren't here last time, as I mentioned before, you can get these videos on my YouTube site as well as any other videos I do. I think I have, I don't know, about 120 um, teaching videos on my YouTube site. I make a few every couple every week and then some Zoom meetings every week. Um, <clears throat> it, it's amazing this technology that we have that we can spread the word of God around the world and never leave our home. <laughs> so it's good. Yeah, the Lord is good. So we're in Hebrews chapter 10, and we got down to the end of verse 14 last time. I'm just going to pick up and read from verse 11 down to 14, just so we know where we are. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Hallelujah. And I'm sure you all agree with me that uh, this is amazing. Eh? The priests before, they could never get rid of sin. Under the old covenant, there was no way to get rid of sin. Even, even with the, the atonement sacrifice that they did once a year, uh, the sin was just merely moved on from year to year. And, you know, God had this done this way so that we would understand that without a Savior, we have no hope. We have no chance of, of anything um, coming to us. There had no chance of our sin be taken away. But we have this high priest, as it says in verse 12. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin. I want to just point out here what he says. He says he had offered for all time. For all time. That means from, from the beginning until the end of time. As, as we know it here on this earth. So under the old covenant, as they were... Uh, The sins was being rolled on from year to year. They were being rolled on until the time of the cross. And when Jesus went to the cross, he took the sins, not only of the people that were living at that time, and not only the sins of the future, yours and my sins, 
but he also took the sins from Abraham or from sorry from Adam all the way to the cross. So he took the sins from past, present, and future. And that's what it's telling us here that when that he sorry, but when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, and he sat down on the right hand of God. This is very important for us to understand because there's a lot of teaching out there about a lot of different things about our forgiveness of sin. And what we need to understand is that Jesus paid the price for our sin once and for all. It goes on in verse 14. It says, because one sacrifice he has made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. He's talking about you and I. He's talking about you and I. He's talking about how we have been made holy because we have accepted the Holy One into our life. Because we have accepted Jesus and what he has done for us, we, we have been set free from the sin that was, was in our way. Now, what is the purpose? Why did Jesus come and take away our sin? What was the point? So is it so that we can have eternal life? Well, that's one of the side effects of us uh, accepting Jesus and him taking our sin away. Unfortunately, oftentimes that's the main reason or the goal that is preached for why we accept Jesus so that we can go to heaven when we die. And that's fine. It's a, it's a true statement. But there's so much more to why we accept Jesus. If you make heaven the goal, then your life here on this earth becomes insignificant and you end up spending more time worrying about yourself and the things of this world than you do about the kingdom of God. And Jesus says in John 10, uh, verse 10, he says, I come to give you life and life to the full. So he's not only come to give us eternal life, but he's come to give us life to the full. So what is the life to the full that he's talking about? Well, he's come to give us life uh, walking with the Father. And that's why Jesus came to this earth to take away the sin so that we could walk in relationship with our Father, that we could be sons of God, that we could be sons of God that are free to come into the presence of God. We've been talking lately with our church and our worship leaders and say, telling them, like, when we worship on Sunday, the point of us worshiping the point of why we why we worship god why we have the music why we we pick the songs that we pick is to take us into the throne room so you know i telling them be, be aware of what's happening in the congregation as we proceed on our way to the throne room going from praise songs to worship songs you need to check and see if somebody's falling behind if somebody's falling behind or somebody's come in late and they're not catching up, then maybe we need to step back into a couple of praise songs and pick them up and bring them with us as we enter into the throne room. Because as we enter into the throne room, then we abide in the presence of God. He's with us all the time. But there's something special when we're in a meeting that we can abide in the presence of God and, and we can hear a message that, that will change our life, that will will completely transform us because we are in his presence. So the purpose of Jesus coming and taking away our sin, yes, it's to go to heaven, but more so it's so that we can have a relationship with our Father in heaven. God's point is he wanted us to come back to the point where he had, or the same relationship he had with Adam and Eve before they left their Garden of Eden where he would come down in the cool of the evening and he would, he would talk with them and chat with them. Now we know that in our physical body, we can't see God in the physical, but in the spiritual, he, he has put in us a new spirit where he abides, where we are the temple of God. And when we live out of that spirit, and that's a process that we need to go through. I got a series on body, soul, and spirit on my YouTube channel. It's 14 sessions. It's when I first started out, so the quality isn't that great, but it's a very powerful message because when we live out of our spirit and not out of our soul, then God can speak to us and he can lead us and he can guide us because that is ultimately what he wants. 
why he sent Jesus down so that we can walk with him in such a way that he can move through us to accomplish what he wants to do for the kingdom of God here on earth. And that's a very powerful message that we're not going to get into. We might talk about it again sometime down the road, but it's why we are being made holy. We are being made holy so that we can walk with an almighty God, that we can, we can call him daddy. We can call him father. We can call him Abba because that's what he is to us, right? And that only happens when our sins are taken away. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's only by relationship through me. It's only coming through me, through the blood and through the curtain, which is his body, that we can come into the presence of God and abide in that presence. And we have this opportunity that was promised to the patriarchs, and God has uh, seen it fit that he would give this opportunity to us as Gentiles to come into this family and to be children of God and to be sons of God. And that's, that's a very powerful thing. So we continue on here today in verse 14, or sorry, we continue on here today in verse 15. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. After what time? After the time that the, the old covenant is over, the new covenant is coming. There's a new time that is coming. And this is what happened when Jesus died on the cross. A new covenant was put into place. I know lots of people think that the new covenant starts at the beginning of Matthew. But it doesn't. The new covenant doesn't start until Jesus has died and come to life again. So the, the, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where Jesus is here on this earth, actually take place under the old covenant. Because it isn't until Jesus dies that we have a new covenant and we walk in a new covenant. So he says, this, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and will write them on their minds. No longer are the laws written on tablets of stone. No longer are they written and, and have to be kept 600 and what is it? 613 laws that the Jewish people had to keep. We don't have all those laws anymore. Jesus told us we have two laws, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. It is about the heart. God has taken a relationship that was out of performance under the old covenant and transformed it into a relationship that is of the heart, that is a relationship of love. Under the old covenant, if you keep my commands and you do all that I tell you, then you will be my people and I will be your God and I will love you. Under the new covenant, we love him because he first loved us. We, we, we walk in this relationship because of his love for us. We walk in this relationship because his desire is for us. And, and we love him because he first loved us. He is the example to us of an unconditional love. And that is so hard for us to understand as human beings, an unconditional love. I try to love my family and I try to love my children unconditionally, but I'm a human being and I, I don't have that ability without, without the presence of God in my heart. And so it's so important for us to, to understand that God's love for us is so unconditional. It's so unconditional. I will put my laws on their hearts and I'll write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. I mean, we read a verse like this and we just fly over it, right? We just go right over it. Yeah, we were just reading through here. We can, I remember one time not long ago, uh, a guy that I used to co-lead with and I was in the church and he was preaching on, on, on I think it was in John. And uh, he he was just racing through the scriptures. I'm thinking like every passage that you're going through is like a two day lesson for me. And you're, you're going, you're just multiplying through these things. There's so much that we're missing. Right. And, and sometimes when we read through these things, we go through so fast that we don't understand what, what is actually being said here. 
But look what it says here. I mean, this is so powerful. It says, then he adds, their sins and all lawless acts, sorry, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. I mean, this is so powerful. This is so freeing. This is so liberating for us when we can come to this understanding. This is what, what David talked about in Psalms 32. Um, let me just go there because that, it's quite powerful what he speaks there, um, David, when he's praying in Psalms 32, because he's talking about us. He says in verse 1, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Who's blessed? Those whose transgressions are forgiven and their sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sins the Lord does not count against him and in whose spirit is no deceit. David is saying, blessed is this, this, these people when this comes, when this promise comes, because he knew what was coming in the future. He knew that there was going to be a son of God that comes, that's going to make things because that promise had been passed down all the way from Abraham. And for you and I today, we are abiding. We are the blessed that David is talking about here. You and I are the blessed ones that, that he's talking about. We, you and I are the ones whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, and who, who no longer have to worry about these things, right? And yet the devil comes along, and he's constantly bombarding us and, and making us sin conscious so that we are always looking at the sin issue around us. But Paul writes here and makes it very clear, you know, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. And that's so amazing. That's so powerful for us. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled and cleansed from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. What an amazing statement that is. I tell you, that is so powerful. You know, therefore, brothers, so he's talking to us, right? Therefore, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, what about you? What about you today? Do you have this confidence? Do you have the confidence? Do you know who you are in Jesus? Do you understand that by what Jesus has done for us, that we are free, we are justified to come into the presence of God? And that's what he's saying here. We have confidence to enter the most holy place. We have been made priests because only a priest can go into the holy place. Only the priest can come into the holy of holies. And only once a year. But now we are free to enter because of Jesus. Because there's a new and living way that's been opened through a curtain. That is his body. And that's why when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain was ripped in two that separated the holy place and the most holy place. I mean, and that was an amazing thing. That was a miraculous thing. That was not just a little light flimsy curtain. If you go back into Leviticus and, and see what that curtain was made of, I mean, that thing was about six inches thick. I think you could tie two, two lorries on that thing and, and have a tug of war and you wouldn't rip that thing. But when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain was ripped in two. And another significant thing that was uh, there with that curtain, embroidery on that curtain was the cherubim that was assigned to cover the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. They were embroidered on that curtain and that was ripped in two. So, so we have access to this tree of life, who is Jesus, who is the cross, who, he is the fruit of life. And through his body, we enter into this holy of holy. We enter into the presence of God. Just like I was talking about earlier, that through our worship in our service, we enter into the presence of God. And we are justified to enter into the presence, not because of who we are, not because of what we've done, but because of who Jesus is and because of what he's done. And as it says here, 
a new and living way, not a dead way, because under the old covenant, everything had to die. There had to be sacrifices. There had, all these animals had to be killed. But we have a new and living way. Even though Jesus died, he rose from the grave. We have this new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have this great high priest over the house of God, his name is Jesus, this high priest. He is king and he is priest. I mean, that's, that's a miraculous thing in itself. And we, we studied about that in chapter 7 and chapter 8. He says, he goes on, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, full of assurance of faith. Full of assurance of faith, knowing that our faith brings us into the presence of God. This whole study of faith is an amazing thing, and we're going to, we're going to get into that in the next chapter. So I'm not going to uh, go into this too much here about this faith. But everything that we get from God, everything that we ac access from God has to be done by faith. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into chapter 11. There's no point in me talking about it now, and then we'll just have to turn around and go through it again in chapter 11. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. This guilty conscience is something that's quite amazing that our our guilty conscience has been taken away it's been taken away like we we aren't guilty anymore let's just go to romans chapter 8 i mean this is quite a powerful scripture it, for us to understand what has happened right therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus no condemnation we're not guilty we don't have to have a guilty conscience because we are not guilty because we have been set free from guilt because of what jesus has done for us there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. <laughs> hey, hallelujah. We have been set free from the law of sin and death. And the devil comes to us and he tries to condemn us of our sin. We are our own worst enemies. When we're, we, we get down on ourselves and we make a mistake and we just feel so bad and God says, no worry, you know, it's just like, just like teaching a kid to ride a bicycle, you know, they fall over, they skin their knee, you get up, you brush them off and okay, let's try it again, let's go again. We just need a small course correction, right? We, we got offline a little bit, let's just get back online and let's just give it again, right? Let's go again. And, and we don't give up, right? And as we talk about faith in the next chapter, we're going to see how that faith enables us that we're able to do that. And so through Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free. That's me and you and all of us that are here. He has set us free from the law of sin and death. We are free. Hallelujah. It is for freedom that Jesus has come to set us free. And so because of that, we are free to come into the presence of God. And we're free to abide with him and to walk with him. That's his greatest desire for us, is to walk with him and to emulate Jesus. And Jesus, when he came to this earth, oftentimes you, you, you hear people say, well, he was able to do what he did because he was God. But that's not true. When, when he came to this earth, he chose to become a human being. And what he did is he presented himself to God in such a way that God could do through him whatever he wanted to do. And in, in the book of John, it's mentioned about 28 times. It, it either says or it infers. And Jesus says that, that the things that I say and the things that I do is not me, but my Father working through me. And this is the position that, that God wants us to come. We don't come to Jesus just so that we can have eternal life. It's true. We have eternal life. We're, that's a side bonus that we get. But we get to abide with God right now. We get to walk with him while we are on this earth right now. We get to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. And then he chooses. Listen to me. He chooses to, to work through us to accomplish his purposes in the kingdom of God. As we abide with him, then he is able to move through us 
to, to accomplish our works. If you go back and you study the, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and going through the wilderness and how they went through the Red Sea and, and Mount Sinai and through the wilderness and eventually ended up in the promised land, that whole story is a roadmap of our Christian life because we are on a journey with God to get to the promised land. And that promised land is a fulfilling of the, of the destiny or purpose that he has for each one of us in the kingdom of God. And, and it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. So let us draw near to God full of, uh, with a sincere heart in full assurance Of our faith, having hearts sprinkled and cleansed from the guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. Thank you, Jesus, that we have been washed and set free. Hallelujah. That we are clean. That, that we have this opportunity that we can come to him and, and just, just be with him. Like, that's what it's all about, right? It, it, so many of us are so worried about trying to find a work to do for God. We're trying to find a ministry to do for God. We burn ourselves out trying to work for God. And all he wants is your heart. But when he has your heart, listen to me. When he has your heart, it will amaze you what he will do through you. But if you're busy running around trying to do everything else, trying to do what you think your call is, trying to do what you think your mission is, and he doesn't have your heart, then you're just, it's just your own works. It's wood, hay, and stubble. It's wood, hay, and stubble. We need to come to the understanding that God doesn't need you to do anything. He spoke this world into existence in six days. What are you going to do for him? Yeah. He spoke in six days. This whole, he created this whole world. What are you going to do? Now, God has chosen to work through us, but he can only work through us when we give him our heart, when we are submitted to him. And when we've come to that point of surrender where we say, God, I can't do this anymore. And, and just about everybody has to go through that at some point in time. We have to come to a point where we realize, hey, I'm just spinning my wheels here. I, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I, I, I can't survive this. And, and we just say, God, what's going on? He says, well, I've been waiting for you to come to this point because now now I can work through you and I can do something. And that's what he desires to do. Amen. Amen. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. We need to believe that. We need to believe that with our whole heart. And, and this, is, this is what it comes down to, right? Belief is such an, uh, an important thing. And I've mentioned many times before when Jesus was asked in John chapter 6, you know, what is the work of God? In verse 29, he answers, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. That's where our hope is. That's the foundation of faith, knowing where our hope is, right? Believing what we do not see in Hebrews 11 and 1. And, and we're going to get into that when we get to, to chapter 11. But we, we, we need to come to a point where we believe no matter what we see. No matter what we see, we put our faith in him. We put our faith in God. Because for he who promised is faithful. God is always faithful. He is faithful. And he is faithful all the time. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. Amen. Let's stop there for today. And that's, that's, uh, I lost my place here. We need to encourage one another. And that, that's why I like these Zoom meetings, you know, all over the world. I'm on a number of different Zoom meetings in different places at different times during the week. And it, it, we can just encourage each other, right? We can just encourage each other. Look, God has a plan and a purpose for you. Brother, sister, God has a plan and a purpose for you. He's got something he wants to do through you. He's just waiting for you just to say, okay, Lord, here it is. 
Here's my heart. I'm going to give up everything that I've been doing. And I'm just going to lay it down to you. If you look at the children of Israel when they crossed into the promised land, you know, and this is hard for us that sometimes our experience is the worst thing that can happen to us <laughs> because God does something with us through us. And we think, okay, well, this is my calling. And we just take off and run with it. Right. And so the children of Israel, when they crossed over uh, the Jordan river and they gained to Jericho and they, I mean, they didn't do anything to Jericho, right? That wasn't them. Them walk, marching around the city didn't bring down the walls. What brought down the walls was God, right? And he brought down the walls. Well, the next little place, the little village that we, they had in their, their sites, they went in there with a, just a small part of the army, and they got beat. <laughs> they got beat. Why? Well, number one, because one person tried to keep the glory of what happened for themselves by keeping some of the, some of the spoils. And, but the other thing was they did not ask God what they should do. They went on their own strength, and they didn't ask God what they should do. And every time we do that, we get into trouble, right? Because we can't do what God is calling us to do on our own strength. Let me tell you this. If God is calling you to do something, and you are able to do it out of your own strength, you can pretty much guarantee that God didn't call you to do that. Normally, 99.9%, when God calls you to do something, it's beyond what you have the ability to do because you have to depend on him to get it done. Amen? I mean, once, once we learn and, and grow or whatever, then God is able to do that. But, but we need to just be so dependent on him. He is our father. You know, oftentimes I go to a meeting where I'm speaking or whatever, and people say, this is the man of God. I want to introduce the man of God to you. And I say, no, please, please don't introduce me as a man of God because a man is not dependent on their father. A man stands on his own. He may have a relationship with his father, but he doesn't depend on his father. I'm a child. I have to depend on my father for everything. And the moment I quit depending on my father for everything, I'm in trouble <laughs> because I'm working on my own strength, right? And, and we, we need to be children, right? We are sons of God, but we are children in his sight, right? We are totally dependent on him. I have a new little grandson. He's only four weeks old. I mean, that little boy is, is uh, dependent on everybody around him, his aunts, his grandma, his grandpa, his mother. You know, he, he is dependent on them for everything. He, he can't do anything himself. And, and that's the way God wants us to come to him. God, I can't do this. I need you. And he says, no problem, my son. I'll give you everything you need. I'll give it to you. It's in you already. If by faith, just reach in and grab it and lay hold of it and go. So I hope this has been an encouragement for you today. Um, it's certainly been a blessing for me being able to share it with you. So... I invite you to unmute yourself, and if you have a comment or a question, please be free. No questions, sir. Okay. Uh, I came in a little bit late. I'm sorry for that. I was held up somewhere. It has been a blessing and uh, always a great time to be in the presence of God. God. Jesus gave us the command that we should make disciples. The process of making a disciple is teaching. I believe that teaching is the backbone of any Christian and unless you are strong and well-based and rooted in the word of God, you are not able to withstand whatever it is that you might come on, the, on, on your way. So I am really grateful for this program. Uh, Stuart, good God bless you. It's a great work. I want also to encourage you. You are doing a great, great work. Thank Far you. much greater than what mainly we are able to see. And uh, I believe God is taking us in the right direction. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. I think we have a new person on here. Annie, I think this is the first time you've been here. Welcome. Hello, Enosh. You've been a, it's been a while since we've seen you. How are you doing? 
Praise the Lord. Hello. Yes, Pastor. Praise the Lord. Oh, just a sec, we got two of you going. Can we just let Andy talk for a minute, Enosh, and then I'll come back to you? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Hello, good evening to everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's really blessed full message for us. This is really a good teaching, a good message from God. Uh, we hear about by from you. And uh, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful message. Uh, yeah, we believe uh, if God chooses us, uh, he will definitely use us uh, for his glory. Amen. And yeah, it's really blessing. Uh, I, it's a really powerful message. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Enosh. Yes, Lord. Amen. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Uh, we are good. But I want some clarification. Pardon me? I want little clarification. Yeah. So, uh, as we uh, started, as we started now, so in the, uh, the book of Hebrews says, Jesus is not remembering uh, remembering us our sins, but why there is uh, judgment for all those are dead and those are alive. I'm, I'm, really hear... I'm having a really hard time hearing you. I don't know if anybody else can hear you better. Okay, some network problem. That's it. Let me chat. Let me write to you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. How do you say your name, Kaloki? You want to pray for us for closing, please? It's okay. We can pray. Let us pray. Okay. But Father, I appreciate your grace. Thank you for the work you've done to us. Thank you for the great teaching and the grace. You bestowed upon our lives to be able to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. It is a great honor to be your servants. We are humbled in your presence. Pray the Lord to continue unveiling these mysteries of the kingdom, and empowering us, King of Glory, to impact our generation with the truth that brings liberty to the people that you created. We are humbled in your presence. We are dependent before you. We pray the Lord our weaknesses will be swallowed in your grace. Help us, our Father, to serve you quickly the glory and honor of your name. Bless your servant, steward good. Continue increasing your grace upon him. Every other person that God Almighty have connected to this program, I pray the Lord your grace you will be supplied to each and every one of us to strengthen and enable us to continue serving you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all Amen. for coming and we will see